On July 19, 2014, Corporal Fernando Aguirre was 45 meters underwater and faced with the decision. He had been called to rescue two divers from a cave in Spain, but that was hours ago, and he wasn't even confident that they were still alive. But he did know two more individuals on the surface were friends of the divers, and they were anxiously waiting for him to return, and not to mention the nearly half dozen specialists that were helping with his rescue mission, or his dive partner that swam beside him. In front of Aguirre was nothing. Well. There was something there, but the issue is Aguirre didn't know what. You see, he literally couldn't see what was in front of him and his dive partner because the underwater cave had been silted out from the pair of divers that went missing. This means that if they entered into the silted part of the cave, they would not be able to see where they were going. So Aguirre was faced with a decision to turn around empty handed or enter into the silt with no way to guide him or his partner. They may find the missing divers or they may go missing themselves. But Aguirre took a deep breath and reminded himself why he was there. With that small moment, he looked at his partner, then began swimming into uncertainty. This is his story. Before we jump into today's story, I want to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations that I may make. It is not on purpose or intentional, and as always, I appreciate every one of you for watching. Cova de los Arquets is a limestone cave that stretches about 80 meters in Costa Brava, Spain, and is known to attract adventurers and underwater photographers alike. For years, Cova de los Arquets remained a hidden treasure to the locals, known only to those who dared to explore its underwater depths. Getting to the cave is an adventure in itself. Once you arrive at Ponte de los Arquets, you must start the dive and continue for another 50 to 60 meters, following the bottom marine until you find the entrance mouth. The entrance descends approximately 10 meters or 33 feet beneath the surface of the sea. The gap is a mere 2.5 meters wide, and it leads to a winding passage filled with stones, ascending about 4 meters. As you explore further, the cave plunges to depths of around 40 meters. But what truly sets Cova del Arquette's apart is the unknown. At the end of the cave lies a small opening, shrouded in darkness and mystery. This obscure passage leads to a muddy cavity that, interestingly, had never had any record of anyone successfully passing through the opening due to its obscurity and the potential absence of visibility depending on sea conditions. On the morning of July 19th, Ricard Denisio and two friends set sailed from the port of Les Sostret, heading towards a local cliff named Captain Labari. The four men had met through a cave diving group and had planned to put their skills to the test that day. The issue was that none of them had ever explored extremely complex or dangerous caves much less a cave system that had not been fully explored. This trip had taken months to plan, and the four men were going to take advantage of their opportunity. The intent that morning was to dive several caves, as there are plenty in the area, and most of them are harmless. Although they had dived in the Costa Brava area before, what attracted them to this cave was the opportunity for new discoveries. Scientists were interested in exploring it, and they would collaborate with divers to ensure a safe entry and exit strategy. The friends were aware of the risk involved in diving at Cova del Arquette's, but that very danger was what made it so captivating and addictive for them. It was like how thrill seekers enjoy activities like skydiving or wingsuit flying. As they approached the area, Ricard Denisio and one of their friends got ready, exchanged nervous looks, and entered the clear blue water. Meanwhile, their fourth friend stayed on the boat, ready to help if anything went wrong. He would be there to assist them, alert nearby divers, and contact authorities in case of any emergencies. Early on, Ricard Denisio and the other diver explored some nearby caves in the area before coming across Cova del Arquette's, or the Cave of the Lobster's submerged entrance. It appeared suddenly before them providing an intriguing path into darkness, and even at a depth of 23 feet, the sunlight illuminated the water, making them feel safe around the entrance. Inside, the cave seemed dark and mysterious, with soft clay walls and silt-covered floors, which posed a risk of blinding them if disturbed. Normally, divers would use a guideline outside the cave for navigation, especially in such conditions. However, earlier in the dive, Ricard had reached to his diving belt, where his spool of guideline rope normally hung. 
and there was nothing there. After all the planning, prep, and dive time, they had forgotten the rope that was their lifeline. It was at this point the men would make a decision. They had waited too long for this moment, and they couldn't stop their dive now. They would just have to proceed without it. So the three men would begin the swim into Cova del Arquette's. With their flashlights, the three men traveled 45 meters, or 148 feet underground and underwater. The beginning stretch of the cave is ideal for recruiting lobsters, hence its second name. But when the rock ends, the texture and terrain vastly changes. The rock gives way, from which point clay and narrow unexplored territory begin. It was here, 45 meters into the cave, that Ricard and Denisio's friend began to feel overwhelmed. He began to panic, completely unsure if he wanted to even be there. Through a series of gestures, he communicated his decision to return to the surface. Although Ricard and Denisio respected his decision, they were determined to continue. They reassured their friend that they would be fine, relying on their experience and instincts. They believed in their abilities and considered trusting their instincts a strength rather than a weakness. Ricard and Denisio shared a determined look signaling their commitment to continue their adventure into the cave. With their flashlights guiding them and the visible entrance reassuring them, they swam deeper. Inside, everything seemed perfect. The silt remained undisturbed, the walls caused no trouble, and sunlight still peeked through. Yet as they delved further, the darkness grew eerie and uncertainty began to creep in. After traveling over 80 meters or 262 feet into the cave, they both realized it was time to turn back. They knew any mishap, even a small disturbance of silt, could jeopardize their escape. However, as they attempted to return, they discovered their fins had stirred up the silt, plunging them into near blindness. Without markers or a rope to guide them, they became disoriented, unsure of which direction was up or down. They reached for each other in the darkness, but found nothing. Unbeknownst to them, their progress had inadvertently created a dense cloud of mud-filled water, effectively erecting a disorienting black wall behind them. The path they had entered through was now obscured, shrouded in impenetrable darkness devoid of any visual markers or lines that could guide them. Ricard and Denisio found themselves in a desperate predicament with no clear path to escape, the weight of their situation intensified by the second as their air supply was limited and would soon be reaching critical levels within their tanks. The search for an exit became an agonizing race against time. Denisio had a sudden realization. Waiting for the silt to settle was not an option. With their air running low, they couldn't afford to wait and hope for clarity. They needed a solution, and they needed it fast. Just when Ricard and Denisio felt trapped in the darkness, a slender beam of sunlight pierced through, offering them a glimmer of hope. Driven by desperation, they made a risky gamble swimming towards it, finding a crack larger than expected. The passage was narrow, and it pressed against their chests and backs as they pushed through it. With each inch, there was an uncertainty whether this passage would lead to safety, or was it just another dead end that would trap them both. The passage went diagonally upwards towards the surface and was 80 meters from the original cave entrance. After a few minutes of fighting through the restriction, Ricard and Denisio would make it through the narrow passage and find a subterranean lake, a bubble of breathable air, a pocket of oxygen that seemed to have been waiting for them for centuries. But this didn't exactly mean that they were safe. Inside the pocket, they hesitated, fearing it would be filled with deadly carbon dioxide. But having no choice, the duo would remove their masks. Luckily, the air was breathable, providing a moment of relief and a surge of adrenaline. Feeling as though they had narrowly escaped death, they snapped photos to remember their stroke of luck. The reality would soon set back in. What now? Meanwhile, their friends had been waiting for the duo to emerge from the water for hours. In sensing trouble, they contacted emergency services at 11 a.m., prompting a swift response from Spain's Civil Guard. Team leader Corporal Fernando Aguirre coordinated a rescue effort, mobilizing divers and enlisting support from various sources to gather information about the cave. Biologists and scientists didn't provide much new information to Corporal Aguirre, which was disappointing because he didn't know much to begin with. One biologist gave a vague map that showed where Ricard and Denisio disappeared. Aguirre and his team believed the missing divers were likely likely inside the salty cave, but they also knew the divers would have surely run out of air at this point. Honestly, Corporal Aguirre had little hope that they were even still alive, but just maybe, they had found a way. Meanwhile, Ricard and Denisio were stuck 
in an air pocket, unsure when help would come. The bubble, measuring approximately 30 square meters with a height of 1.5 meters, seemed like a sanctuary as it held an estimated 35,000 liters of air. But this was still only a limited amount of air, and once it ran out, they would slowly suffocate. But there was another problem. As Ricard and Denisio breathed the air, it was slowly turning into carbon dioxide, making it harder for them to breathe and poisoning their bodies. The more they breathed, the more they hurt themselves. But if they didn't breathe, they couldn't survive. It was a paradox. They struggled to stay afloat because the cave's walls were slippery and there was nowhere to rest. The effort made them breathe faster, worsening the effects of carbon dioxide poisoning. And as time passed, they became dehydrated, cold, and hopeless. Ricard was in worse condition than Denisio, but they both knew their situation was bad and they accepted that they might not make it out alive. They didn't want to talk or even look at each other. All they desired was quietness in the dark cave. Over time, Ricard struggled to keep himself afloat, often slipping beneath the water's surface unnoticed. Denisio, drained and worn out, summoned all of his strength each time to rescue his friend. It was during one of these episodes that Denisio would glance at his friend, only to witness the sight of his body, almost lifeless, continuously slipping below the water. A surge of adrenaline coursed through Denisio's veins as he summoned every ounce of strength he had left. He managed to grab a hold of Ricard and pulled his head above the water's surface, fighting against the inevitable doom that leaned over them. Five more hours would pass. There was no more air in Ricard or Denisio's tanks. Their bodies were shaking from the cold, and they could barely keep their heads above the water. They were exhausted. Their minds and bodies were beginning to fail them. Ricard's weakened body would once again slip into the water as he had no control, but this time, Denisio could only watch the lifeless body of his friend submerge into the water. He could do nothing but lay on the slippery rock half submerged in the water himself. His body was devoid of any strength, and he knew that it was only a matter of time before he too would join his friend. Unbeknownst to Denisio, Corporal Argiri and his team of skilled divers had been searching for them since 5 p.m. They had encountered a thick layer of silt stirred up by Ricard and Denisio earlier, which had delayed the two divers as they were forced to decide if it was worth putting their own lives in danger. For all they knew, Ricard and Denisio were not even alive, and they could just wait for the silt to settle. And Corporal Aguirre had not given up hope yet. As the night descended, the divers retreated, finding nothing within the silt-covered cave, and leaving Denisio to grapple with fear and exhaustion. However, the search resumed the next morning, drawing attention from numerous journalists. Despite the influx of experienced rescuers from across the country, the chances of finding Ricard and Denisio seemed bleak. But finally, one thing was going their way. The silt had settled by the morning, allowing clearer visibility for the divers. Before entering the cave, they secured a dive line outside to prevent getting lost like Ricard and Denisio. The divers would reach the 80 meter mark where they would come across a beam of light that was impossible to see the day before because of the amount of silt in the cave. As they looked towards the light, they noticed a small crack within the rock that was just wide enough for a diver to squeeze through. They had exhausted all other options. So they thought, just maybe, this was where Ricard and Denisio had gone. Inside, they followed the faint glimmer of light, imagining it was the route the missing men took. The first rescuer encountered tight passages, but pressed on, and eventually reached the large subterranean lake. The diver would begin to sweep the area with his flashlight, and would see the body of a diver. His heart sank as he noticed it was Ricard, and he thought in that moment that all was lost. While still looking for another body, he would see the legs of another diver halfway into the water, and after emerging from the cave, he was surprised to hear a faint sound, the sound of someone breathing. Denisio was clinging desperately to a rock with the little strength that he had left. When Denisio realized he wasn't alone anymore, he let out a pained cry, startling Corporal Aguirre and the other diver. Although Denisio had somehow managed to cling to life in the treacherous conditions, he was severely weakened by exhaustion, dehydration, hypothermia, and disorientation, making his survival uncertain. While it was a relief he was still alive, Extracting him from the cave presented another daunting challenge. Despite the proximity of rescue, Denisio resisted wearing the air tank they offered, delirious and unable to comprehend the situation, mistaking the rescuers as threats. 
Understanding Denicio's confusion, Corporal Aguirre realized he needed someone familiar to cooperate. Urgently returning to the surface, he persuaded Denicio's diving companion to join the rescue mission. Despite the uncertainty, he agreed, recognizing it as the only hope for Denicio's survival. Re-entering the cave with additional rescuers, they navigated to the air pocket where Denicio awaited. Seeing a familiar face brought some comfort. But as time dwindled, Corporal Aguirre decided to sedate Denicio to ensure a safe extraction. Less than a day after entering the cave, Denicio emerged with Corporal Aguirre, the rescue team, and his friend. With Denicio safe, attention turned to recovering Ricard's body. Denicio's survival marked a remarkable feat, making him the first diver in Spain to endure such an ordeal. Following the media frenzy, Corporal Aguirre initiated a thorough investigation into the tragic dive. The importance of training in high-risk situations like underwater cave diving cannot be overstated. First and foremost, training provides divers with a thorough understanding of the risks associated with cave diving, including hazards such as low visibility, entanglement, equipment failure, and psychological challenges like nitrogen narcosis and hypoxia. By recognizing these dangers, divers can make informed decisions and take appropriate precautions to mitigate risk. Moreover, training ensures that divers are proficient in the use of specialized equipment, such as rebreathers, dive lights, and guideline reels, which are essential for navigating the unique conditions found in underwater caves. The discovery of Ricard's death was eventually ruled as carbon dioxide poisoning. Critical safety measures, such as deploying a dive line, were overlooked, contributing to the dire outcome. Some faulted Denicio for Ricard's demise, but Corporal Argiri's report acknowledged that he already saved his friend multiple times, but that in the end, he just didn't have enough strength to prevent him from drowning. But despite all of this, what matters most is that one diver lost his life, and another was changed forever. Thankfully, Denicia would make a remarkable full recovery.